It is said that when Alexander the Great first set foot in Asia, he threw his spear into the ground and proclaimed that the land all belonged to him. But besides the drama that preluded the battle, the Granicus is interesting because like Caesar at the Battle of Bibracte or Napoleon at Monte Note, it's his first real test. It's Alexander's first real challenge. After putting down rebellions in Greece and the Balkans, he marches his men across the Hellespont into Asia, where he now faces a Persian army somewhere near modern-day Turkey. But more than that, the Granicus also gives you a sense for how Alexander planned offensive maneuvers. How did he think on the battlefield? As we go through and discuss the events that unfolded here, I'm going to be making a note of the key tactical points that not only occurred on the day, but that would also emerge as patterns throughout all of Alexander's great battles. Now, the final reason that the Granicus is fascinating is that it enlightens us as to what made Alexander unique. What's the thing that made him special? Not only as a general, but as a leader. But before we get to that, let's first take a look at the armies present here. He is, as usual, outnumbered. And this is the first pattern that you notice in a lot of his set-piece battles. Outnumbered. Whether it's the Granicus, Issus, Galgamela, and here today he has about 18,000 men, divided into about 4,000 cavalry that you see here in the wings, represented by these pieces, and the infantry in the center here, represented by these blocks. Opposing him are the Persian forces, who number about 30,000 men, almost twice his size. And the, the cavalry, their cavalry here hold the front, with their infantry at the back. At the start of the battle, both sides lined up on either side of this river here. That's about 30 meters wide, or about 100 feet for my American friends. And for Alexander, it presented quite the obstacle because it allowed the Persians to hold a strong defensive position on its steep banks. So in questioning what to do about this obstacle, Alexander gathers his general to discuss it. You know, what are the solutions we can come up with? And one of them suggests, listen, how about we retreat for the day, go back to our camp, wake up early at dawn tomorrow, and perhaps try and catch them off guard, try and cross it in an area that's uncontested, and we can win the day that way. And Alexander, in his typical response, says, no, I didn't come all this way from Greece, march hundreds of miles to be delayed by a river. We're going to charge directly across it, head on. Now, hold on. You might be thinking, what's his plan here? Why is he adopting a tactic that seems so poorly thought out? You know, attacking an enemy who holds a strong defensive position like this when outnumbered does not seem like the mindset of a man who would go on to have one of history's largest ever empires. Well, here's the thing. Despite being outnumbered so often, Alexander basically had one of the best armies of all time with him. A gift from his father, Philip II, who during his reign had doubled the size of the infantry and the cavalry and had also saw to the formation of the Macedonian phalanx shown here. And they were unique in that they carried what is known as a sarissa, a sarissa pike. And these were extra long pikes that extended out to about six meters in length. And they basically made this phalanx unapproachable from the front. But by far the most potent force in Alexander's army were the companion cavalry here. And they were basically the equivalent of a modern day elite special force unit. These guys were the best heavy cavalry probably not just in Alexander's lifetime, but probably during the entire ancient world. I can't think of any BC era cavalry that could rival these guys. If you do know one, please let me know in the comments. But as far as I know, this elite equestrian force were the best of the best. Men who were not only well trained, disciplined and drilled, but they also rode the fastest horses, had the best weapons available, and as well as, wore, as, well as wearing the finest armor that money could buy. All of this is to say is that there was a significant skill gap between Alexander and whoever was unfortunately facing him on the other side. So at the start of the battle, Alexander's first order is to send his light cavalry to attack the Persian left, perhaps to try and test their response. They manage to successfully cross the river, but are met by heavy resistance and pushed back. But importantly, they're not defeated. So seeing this, Alexander gives the signal for the rest of his men to charge across and the fighting begins. Now he does something interesting here. He orders his companions to charge directly for the center, directly where the Persians are strongest. And you might be thinking, okay, what's his, what's his thinking here? Why is he doing this? And 
It's actually kind of brilliant. What Alexander surmises is that the Persians have given themselves a false sense of security and confidence due to their position and terrain. Using the element of surprise acting as a force multiplier, should Alexander crush them where they think they're strongest and win, its effect on enemy morale would ripple across the battlefield and it's basically game over. And this is our third point here on the list. Alexander loved attacking an enemy center of gravity. Attack center of gravity. He loved taking these incredibly risky plays that are difficult to execute. They don't really make sense on paper, but if successful, they give him a resounding victory. And so as the companions here cross the river, they move up the steep bank and are met by a hail of Persian javelins before an intense melee takes place. In the back and forth of swords and spears, Alexander here, who's in the thick of the action, has a bunch of close calls. First, he has his horse killed from underneath him. Then a cleaver strikes his head, knocking his helmet off. And in one particularly near incident, he's almost struck a lethal blow from behind before being saved at the last second by one of his men. This intense hand-to-hand -hand fighting was not because it's his first battle here and he wants to prove something. In fact, Alexander would get injured a lot throughout his campaigns and not just light wounds, mind you, but he got seriously injured. He'd get stabbed, break bones, and years down the line, an arrow through the lung almost kills him. And the reason that he suffered so many close calls was that Alexander always led from the front. He was a real leader, the true warrior king. And it's the thing that sets him apart from all the other greats of history, like Chinggis Khan and Napoleon. He was the vanguard king. Vanguard king. Sure, you had someone like Caesar who was sometimes known to fight at the front, but the Roman only would do so in the most dire of circumstances. For Alexander here, his sense of destiny was so strong that there was nowhere else he could be, and time and time again, he was the one that led his companions directly into the thick of brutal fighting. And don't get me wrong, what he did was incredibly risky, but can you imagine the impact it must have had on the rest of his men? I mean, say you're a soldier here, say you're one of these men, pike in one hand, shield in the other, you're marching to battle, anxious about the clash of steel, nervous about the violence. Do you get to see tomorrow? Do you ever get to go home to your wife and children? But suddenly your worries are drowned out, vanishing as the thunderous sound of a hundred horses charging, charging ahead of you. And to your right, you look up and there is your king. And he's riding at the very tip of the army. He's the one leading the assault into the enemy center. I mean... Who would dare to disobey an order from this man or run when things got heavy? Now, despite all the close fighting that was going on here, the companions eventually managed to drive back the Persians with help from the infantry who had now caught up. Once the infantry joined, through superior skill and discipline, they managed to break the center with the wings soon following afterwards. Unfortunately, this left the poor Persians infantry at the back with no defense on the side, with no defense on the flanks here, and the Macedonians soon surrounded them and finished them off, giving Alexander the victory at the Battle of the Granicus. Thank you so much for watching. If you can like and subscribe, as always, I do appreciate it so much. And if you could give me your feedback, your thoughts, please, I always do appreciate it so much. And I'll see you all next video. Thank you.